everyone, Dark of All Trades here. Now, a little while back, I did a video talking about hell and how it disproves any god worthy of anyone's attention, let alone worship. In the comment section, I was asked to do a take about the carrot part of the carrot and the stick. So today, I'm going to dive into the idea of heaven and how the idea of heaven does the exact same thing. It disproves any god that would make a heaven. Across religions worldwide, conceptions of God or the divine share certain common superlative attributes, omniscience, omnipotence, together with benevolence, justice, and mercy beyond any conceivable human expressions. And all good God's creation should perfectly reflect these qualities. So let's take a closer look at one cornerstone of traditional Christian theology, heaven. Mainstream doctrine describes heaven as an eternal realm of uninterrupted happiness praising God, with no sorrow, negativity, or even the possibility of further moral growth permitted once souls pass through the pearly gates. Souls essentially become happy puppets basking in divine glory. But does this remarkably simple, even mundane picture of endless stagnant cheer truly sound like the output of a transcendent being overflowing with creativity and love for humanity? Would an all-wise God fail to grasp joy deeper than an everlasting church service crossed with a smiley emoji? When contrasted with claims of the boundless reaches of divine love and innovation, traditional heaven risks seeming less like the greatest conceivable eternal destination overflowing with stimulation across spiritual dimensions, and more resembling the product of an uninspired mediocre theological thinking that sold humanity short. Today, I'll be scrutinizing whether heaven as typically depicted aligns at all with the glory and excellence and perfect all-powerful being would design for souls. If it does not, it reveals this perfect being may not exist at all. When picturing heaven, visions of angels on clouds strumming harps often come to mind. But what does Christianity officially teach about the eternal heavenly realm for saved souls? Across Catholic, Protestant, and Eastern Orthodox strands, clear commonalities emerge from scripture and doctrine about the afterlife with God. Firstly, heaven is depicted as a physical realm separate from earth, Biblical passages describe mansions, cities with walls, precious stones, gardens, and rivers. Not just a spiritual dimension. Souls possess physical form, continuity of identity, and recognition of those previously known. It is also consistently conveyed as a sphere removed from all suffering, mourning, death, or pain present in earthly life. No needs go unsatisfied. Paradise regained from evil's encroachment. Visions are uniformly glorious, but starkly simple an eternity centered wholly on continuously praising the glory, might, and mercy of the triune God amid angelic choruses, with no distractions from this eternal chorus of admiration. Mental states are portrayed as persistently joyful, reverent, and awestruck, what Revelation terms God's peace that transcends understanding. But the richness of human experience gives way to uniform happiness channeled Godward, Saints described as simple servants delighted to worship forever, suggesting a form of divine Stockholm Syndrome. So in sum, heaven is commonly understood as everlasting emotional and sensory pleasure detached from earthly woes, yet without deeper challenges to spur growth, focused solely on perpetual praise lacking nuance. Does this sound like perfection or tedious stagnation within a religious hum? Let's take a look at the actual argument I'm putting forth. Premise 1. An all-loving God would desire the ultimate well-being and happiness for all individuals. Premise 2. Ultimate well-being includes the experience of free will, the opportunity for moral growth, and the richness of complex emotions. Premise 3. Traditional conceptions of heaven depict a state of eternal bliss, harmony, and perfection. Premise 4. In a traditional heaven, there is a lack of significant challenges, moral dilemmas, and opportunities for genuine moral growth since everything is ideal. Conclusion, therefore, the traditional concept of heaven as a place devoid of struggle and moral complexity contradicts the idea of an all-loving God who desires the highest well-being for individuals through the pursuit of free will, moral growth, and the experience of complex emotions. Let me explain how I came to this. A core premise in conceptions of God across faiths is benevolence, not just loving generally, but possessing perfect love unbounded by limits of human understanding. If the biblical heavens flowed from a font of perfect love and creativity, what should we therefore expect eternally? Consider first what deep love desires for those we care for most here on earth. Rich bonds, exciting adventures, growth in character, and purpose acted upon, not forced stagnation with a gilded cage of passive happiness detached from greater meaning. Why would perfect divine love differ? Additionally, few today consider forced conformity and obedience to authority as ideals. Why should the crown of creation maintain no autonomy in heaven? Spontaneity replaced by an eternity as choir members hitting assigned notes in praise. 
Can ongoing challenge, contemplation, and growth no longer refine souls beyond Earth, contradicting the idea of eternal progression? Do loved ones lose all complexity to become smiling servants absorbed in divine glory? Is individual identity erased, or do family and friends now seem less deep without moments of sadness coloring joy? Either God lacks something in benevolence or creativity to design such a simple paradise, or humanity misunderstood the divine vision. Because frank bribery of happiness, devoid of depth, meaning, relationships, and maturity, ultimately ringing hollow sounds much more consistent with our own limitations than capabilities fitting an infinite being overflowing in love. The heaven typically envisioned seems ruled by a petty narcissist, demanding endless flattery from puppets, not originated by divine wisdom and love desiring the full blossoming of conscious creatures. The challenge heaven presents is conceiving how shallow images arose from assumptions on un unlimited greatness. To dive deeper into theological tensions heaven reveals, consider the examples that spotlight the dilemma. If we discovered a human leader engineered followers to only experience positive emotions directed towards praising their greatness forever, we would deem them unethical at best and abusive at worst. Yet this resembles typical heaven. Similarly, suppose a spouse pharmacologically manipulated their partner to smile gleefully when gazing at them without deeper responsiveness. We would judge the dominated partner state tragic and hollow, not exemplary love. Yet, doctrinally, heaven fosters obedience and joy to God throughout constant heavenly pharmacy. Or imagine your favorite beloved historical figures without even temporary gloom permitted as part of complexity, just cheerful, hymn-singing emanations of goodness. This sounds more like an angelic antidepressant advertisements than human souls maintaining identity. Why would divine benevolence erase intricacy? Picturing only joy without contrast simply makes joy less fully joy. Those realizing highest human potential combine supreme happiness with struggle and even moments of desolation creating depth. Simplistic bliss seems crafted by limited minds, not divine glory worthy of eternity. While escaping suffering holds appeal, true love also desires growth for beloveds. Why banish growth from heaven? Do souls not proceed through virtues progressively anymore? Courage leading to loving sacrifice seasoned by loss, bringing fuller delight and purpose? Such advancement makes heaven appealing, not just escape. In sum, an eternal existence displaying rich legacy meeting broadened potential offers inspiration, but sipping milk and honey heavenly sedated after death bears less resemblance to a creator god tirelessly working, creating, embracing complexity, and more to quaint but myopic musings of ancient minds. The dilemma heaven reveals about divine nature pushes towards accepting richer possibilities. To spotlight the dilemma of heaven's design, envision this ethical thought experiment. Suppose you discover your spouse was covertly seeing a hypnotist to recondition them. Through psychological manipulation, chemical substances, and neural implants, bit by bit they were transformed into the perpetually smiling, agreeable, allegedly perfect partner, proclaiming their praise for you endlessly without deeper responsiveness. All complexity in their identity slowly faded as a programmed happiness took over directed toward you. Most would recoil, sensing that brainwashing fundamentally violates human dignity despite aiming to generate a devoted, loving partner. This simplistic narcosis parasitically serves the fulfiller, not the needs of the fulfilled. It crosses lines of consent and autonomy human relationships require. Yet envisioning heaven elicits no similar moral pangs for believers. God's love somehow permits extinguishing freedom and personal identity in exchange for emotional placation and distorted devotion, exceedingly surpassing the spouse's situation in erasing wills through literal eternal spiritual reconditioning. Here, moral intuitions clash revealingly against religious assumptions. Clearly loving beings should augment flourishing in others, not dependent adoration through brain remolding. For God to override consent, role modeling ethical relations seems questionable at best. Souls deepened finding purpose at peak intellectual rigor appear more consistent with divine aspirations for beloved creation than lobotomized bliss. So perhaps conceptions of God deserve rethinking, and notions of heaven liberation from limitations that subvert human ideals. If our moral compass conflicts with depictions of perfect love or justice divine enlightenment transcends, it implores questioning which compass merits recalibrating, and which perspectives reflect sanctified Stockholm Syndrome normalizing heavenly psychological captivity. No argument, however, is without its objectors. Here are some that I would anticipate and how I would respond. Some may argue that the absence of challenges and struggles in heaven is precisely what constitutes perfect love. In this view, a state of eternal bliss and happiness may be seen as the ultimate expression of divine love, providing a contrast to the hardship of earthly existence. 
While perfect bliss may be considered a form of love, an all-loving God would also prioritize the richness of experience, personal growth, and autonomy for his creations. True love might encompass both happiness and the opportunity for meaningful challenges and development. Advocates of traditional heaven might suggest that the simplicity of the envisioned paradise is due to divine wisdom that surpasses human understanding. From this perspective, what may seem limited or lacking to humans could be part of a grander, incomprehensible plan designed by a benevolent god. While acknowledging the possibility of divine wisdom beyond human understanding, the argument still questions whether the traditional depiction aligns with the attributes commonly ascribed to an all-loving god. Openness to divine mystery doesn't necessarily preclude thoughtful consideration of the concepts presented in religious texts. One could argue that the traditional concept of heaven doesn't imply stagnation, but rather eternal growth in spiritual and moral perfection. The absence of earthly struggles may not equate to a lack of progression, but rather a transcendence to a higher state of being. The concern raised is not about eternal growth itself, but about the lack of struggle and moral complexity in the traditional depiction. The argument suggests that an all-loving God would desire a more intricate and challenging environment that still allows for continual spiritual and moral progression. Supporters of the traditional heaven may emphasize the idea that a harmonious and unified existence, devoid of conflicts and strife, is the epitome of divine love. In this view, a community of individuals living in perfect peace could be seen as the fulfillment of an all-loving God's desire for unity. While harmony and unity are important, an all-loving God might also value individual autonomy and the complexity that arises from personal experiences and choices. Unity need not require uniformity, and diversity in experiences could contribute to a richer, more meaningful existence. Critics might argue that the human understanding of heaven is limited and that religious texts may be metaphorical or subject to misinterpretation. They could contend that the traditional depiction of heaven is a symbolic representation and the actuality might differ from popular conceptions. Acknowledging the potential for misinterpretation, the argument engages with the commonly held view of heaven to question its consistency with an all-loving God. It encourages a reconsideration of the interpretation and opens the door to alternative understandings that align more closely with divine benevolence. Some theological perspectives propose alternative visions of heaven that include elements like free will, personal growth, and complexity. Those who adhere to such interpretations might argue that not all conceptions of heaven lack the qualities mentioned in the original argument. The argument does not dismiss alternative conceptions of heaven that incorporate free will, personal growth, and complexity. Instead, it specifically challenges the traditional view that lacks these elements. It invites a broader exploration of diverse theological perspectives that may align more closely with the attributes of an all-loving God. In the end, while traditional notions of heaven aim to offer inspiration beyond earthly sorrows, they falter by actually diminishing core qualities religious perspectives otherwise rightly uphold. Concepts bordering on compelled happiness, puppetry, devotion, and static experience fail to capture the richer possibilities and an omnipotent being unbound by limitations could design to surpass highest human conceptions of embrace. And they shine light on signs of failure in theological imagination more likely rooted in very human psychological projections than divine revelation. The highest worship responds freely to evidently supreme love, not love imposed by overwhelming force vainly seeking recognition. So perhaps heaven merits re-envisioning, unconstrained by assumptions that sell the creator short with suspiciously familiar limitations. A realm, perfected ethics, and intimacy beyond earthly dynamics seems more plausibly indicative of true spiritual perfection rather than endlessly prostrate monks monotonously chanting inside gilded sanctuaries. Our world displays the glory of innovative variety and complex elegance flowing from divine ingenuity. Should the source of this creativity ever cease astonishing with new wonders? Conceptions stagnating in comfortable ritual arrested development seem far too familiar, ordinary, and uninspired to approach God's best dreams for beloved heirs coming of age. At least according to the Richter scales inherent to souls, God supposedly calibrated directly to resonate with glimpses of such glory. That's it for this one. So what did you think? Do you agree with me when I say that if heaven at least as commonly described or envisioned existed, it would disprove the God that believers propose made it? Or do you think there are other ideas that change the parameters that I should take a second look at? Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you like this kind of breakdown, let me know in the comments as well. This type of video entails a bit different work than a response video. It is easier to edit, but others may find it less fun. If this is something you like, hit that like button. If, however, you like this kind of content directly handed to you by the almighty algorithm, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Though a long beam of holy light onto my patrons, Calamitous Anima, Sora, Long-Haired Lefty, 
Musical Ocelot, Ooga Booga Luga, Tarek Alkasab, Jamabomb, Kai Henningsen, and Triple Tau, who elevate my channel to the highest reaches one can imagine. If you would like to be one of the ones hanging out on a cloud playing a harp, you can join them for as low as a single dollar a month at patreon.com front slash dark of all trades. Every one of you is a note to the glorious choir that makes up my channel. It is music to my ears. Thank you. And as always, keep learning.